Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd. So this is going to be kind of like a fringe episode in, uh, from a, as far as... Uh, like right now, this is not going to be necessarily an episode where I continue talking about my life. I mean, that's going to continue from the next episode. But this is more or less like, uh, I guess you could say... Uh, uh, not, not, I won't say it necessarily a uh, summary... But just something to focus on. It's kind of like something that came to my mind. Something that I thought about that I didn't really look at it. I didn't look at it the way I look at it now while it was happening. And and this is like, a, and it's kind of like as I was making the videos, I kind of started to notice this pattern. And then not just the videos like that I'm making now, but also with the book that I wrote. Because I, I go back and I read, I have to reread it and edit it and then check certain things. Because uh, I, I talk to family members, or I talk to different people that remind me. Of like, okay, maybe, all right, this didn't happen exactly like that. Or at this time, maybe I had the time period wrong, so I have to go back and fix things. Because, I mean, I started writing the book after I had already been out of America for like 15 years. I actually started writing the book during the war. Uh, when, the, when the war started in Yemen, as uh, just as I was bored. You know, I was really, really just bored. And uh, we didn't have any electricity. I had to go and charge up my laptop, uh, you know, at a, at a coffee shop in the beginning. So I would come back with the laptop charged up and just like try to just get as much writing done as I could before the laptop died and I couldn't use it again. But then as the war went along, I was writing the, uh, the autobiography, like just my, my life up until that point, and also writing what was happening daily in the war. But then this, it got to the point where I couldn't go to the coffee shop anymore because the, the war was too hectic. It's too much bombing, too much craziness. I mean, the last time that I did go to the coffee shop, I remember, I, like, they, they said there was a peace treaty between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. So I was like, ah, oh, alhamdulillah. As soon as, uh, as soon as I heard the news, I said, okay, tomorrow, inshallah, I'm going to go out early. I'm going to go to the coffee shop and see what's going on. Let me read the news because we had no news. We had no, because we don't, have, number one, we don't have a TV in the house. Number two, we didn't have internet in the house. So no internet, no TV. And then on top of that, even if we did have all those two things, there was no electricity. So, you know, but I mean, even with the electricity, we just never had internet in the house. Because back in those days, internet was like for rich folks in Yemen. It wasn't something, this is 2015 in Yemen. But it, it was like the 1990s, as far as like internet was concerned. So, all that type of stuff, it just, uh, you know, it just didn't exist. We didn't have that in the house. So, I, if I wanted to check something, I would have to go out to an internet cafe or something, or to a coffee shop where they had wireless internet. And I would check it, check whatever, and I check the news and see what was going on in those places. So I went out that day, the next day and I said, okay, alhamdulillah, I can find out what's going on. And then it's just like, as I'm sitting there in the coffee shop, I'm drinking the coffee. Check, I'm sitting outside because it's beautiful weather that day. And uh, the Kasana it has beautiful weather. Like in the summertime, and especially like it, in the in-between seasons, like, you know, the fall and the autumn, like the fall and the, and, and the springtime. The weather's beautiful. It's it's not hot. You can sit outside, and you know you're not you know you don't feel uncomfortable. It's got like the nice mountain breeze because you're way up in the mountains. You know you're like uh, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, like uh, Sana's like maybe four thousand meters above sea level. It's very high above sea level. So I mean you got mountains surrounding Sana. So it's but it's, the weather's just beautiful. So I was sitting outside. And then all of a sudden you just hear, D -d 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 and I was like, oh no, oh no. And then of course I checked the news and then the treaty broke. And then they started fighting. Now I got to go home while the planes are bombing. So I was like, forget this. I'm not going back out again. So that's that was like the end of my writing the book. So then I had to wait until I got to Saudi Arabia. You know, if I lived to get to Saudi Arabia. Because even going to Saudi Arabia, like while we were on the bus, they were shooting across, the, you know, like we were driving right through the fighting in Ma'rib as they were just like, you know, literally fighting in front of us, you know. And it's just like the bus is just going like, Bismillah, Natawakal, Allah, you know, so, Allah must But anyway, so, so when I got to Saudi Arabia, then I actually continued the book. So it is like, by the, so we're looking like 2016, you know, so I've been out of America, to, you know, been away from my city for 17 years, because I left Jacksonville in 1999. So that's a long time, and then to now to start writing things. So of course, it's always going to be mistakes, things I got to go back and revise. But as I was going back and revising it, so the point is, uh, is that I started to notice like this trend. You know, it started everything, all those major changes in my life. It started 
Always. It always happened with a book that I read. You know, it was always a book. There was always a book involved. And it's, if you've been following this series, you notice this. Uh, uh, from from the time that I went to jail to the time I got out of jail to the time I went back to jail again to the you know to the to that time I got out of jail, it's always been some type of book. It was something that I read in jail that made me start to change. And then I get out of jail, something that I read and that made me keep on changing. And you know, so there was this constant change, but it was always a book at the epicenter of it all. And as this series continues, you're going to see more and more books. You know, books that changed my life, book that changed my life, book that changed my life. So even 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 to the point when I became a practicing Muslim and went to Atlanta, there's a book that I read, you know, that made me like, okay, I'm going to try to be like the Salaf now. I'm going to start to, you know, I want to memorize Hadith. I want to memorize Quran and Hadith. I want to get up at night and pray. I want to fast. I want to do all these types of things. It's always something that I read. And it's, it just goes to show you that the importance of, the, of that seeking, you know, not just seeking knowledge, but being a reader. You know, I'm going back to read. So when I was a kid, I, uh, this is like this is not a good example, but it is an, an, an example. So when I was a young kid, I, I think uh, I must have been like maybe this is after I became Muslim. So I became Muslim when I was 15. So maybe like the next year, maybe around 16, 16, 17, I got a hold of a book. It was called uh, Monster, the autobiography of, a, of an L.A. gang member. All right. This was written by. Sanyika Shakur, uh, and he was a he was an eight trade gangster crip in Los Angeles. Uh, he was a big you know big gang member. The time that he wrote the book, he was locked up in Pelican Bay, and in, uh, in the California you know in solitary confinement. Like he was that dangerous that they wouldn't allow him even in the population. So he during that time that he was in uh, the prison, he started to also have this type of transformation. Now, now he really didn't become Muslim, although there was a Muslim. Who influenced him, which is Muhammad Abdullah. He's a brother in Los Angeles. I only got the chance to meet Muhammad Abdullah once. You know, I mean, of course, this is after I already knew who he was from the book, as you're going to see in a second. So, I mean, it was a Muslim that influenced him, but he was more influenced influenced by the same thing that you see I was influenced by. And he also, his, reading his book, caused the influence that uh, that you see throughout my my series. You know, when I talk about George Jackson, when I talk about the Black Panthers, that came from reading his book. Alright, so when I was, uh, like I said, it must have been 16, 17, 17, I, I'll say 16 at the earliest, 17 at the latest, you know, I think I might have read it when I got out of jail the first time, because I went to jail when I was 17 years old uh, for a shooting, you know, because uh, what happened was we went up in, uh, I mean, I did the crime when I was 16, but I got locked up for it when I was 17, so basically my friend, he, he got a gun, and we just like I, you know, I, you know, I just actually just explained the story to my sister because my sister just asked me. So my, I just saw my sister for the first time. My sister is the first person in my family, and not just family, just anybody. I haven't seen, I haven't made any attempt to see anybody since I've been back in America. I've been back in America now a year and a half, because we came back at the not even a year and a half. We came back in mid December of uh, 2022. 2021 sorry so i was here all of 2022 and then of course now 2023 so close to a year and a half right and i haven't made any attempt to see anybody in my family i just i, I just i don't i'm you know just been like secluded i don't i don't want to all i want to be around is the muslims i didn't want to be around fact, i talked to my mother and everything but because she lives in a different city and everybody's so spread out that i just I, you know i haven't been in the you know in the right mindset to go and visit them so my sister she came over and uh, she was here, what was this, like, uh, I guess Sunday or something, because she was in Jacksonville, inside the city. She was visiting family, obviously, because it's a holiday for them. So she said, okay, I'll stop by. She bought some stuff for my kids. She wanted to give it to them. So, and then she, you know, this, throughout the conversation, this came up about the shooting, right? Like, why I did it? Like, why? Well, what was the purpose? I mean, because obviously, if it was like some type of problem that we have between individuals, and I was shooting at somebody because... And I said, nah, I said, I don't even know the guy that I shot at. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't, you know, why I did it. You know, it was, it was very random, but it wasn't random. And she was like, well, how do you, what do you mean by that? I said, because, you know, when we were in middle school, you know, like earlier in school, like uh, elementary school, we were mostly around poor kids. And even my sister, we talked about this. I said, because, you know, we were in an all black school. 
So, you know, even she told me for the first time, she never talked about this before. She said, like, you know, she was telling me, like, how she felt just growing up in school as being, like, you know, where, like, you know, you're in America, but now in the school, you're the minority. Like, you know, you're, you're a white kid, but you're the minority. But, I mean, for me, I never felt that way. Because, I mean, I'll tell you one thing. Like, the only time that I ever felt anything about race was between, it was the, with the white family members. But when I was at school, nobody brought that stuff up. Nobody like, oh, you're white, you're white, you're white. Everybody was just cool. You know, so, and as I was growing up, that's why I, I you know, I, I go to my family. And, of course, because I'm talking differently, you know, because of this is the way I'm coming up. I mean, the, I'm six years old, eight, like, not six years old, I say like about like about seven, eight years old. And uh, I'm listening to Dougie Fresh, Dougie Fresh and the Get Fresh crew. You know, which came out like like 90, 1984 or something, you know. So they came out when I was six years old. You know, I'm memorizing, I'm going home and writing down the lyrics and memorizing the lyrics. And LL Cool J came out with like, I'm bad, about the same time, uh, Dougie Fresh. This is the stuff that I was listening to when I was a kid. And I was dressing like, you know, in the, with the beaded jacket and the, and the you know, and, the, and the, dressing like the break dancer. So when I go around my family, they're just like, you know, what, what's, wrong, what's wrong with this kid? Look how he's talking. Look how he's acting. You know, it's because of the environment. But see, the thing is that I only noticed that when I was around the family. When I was at school, nobody, you know, everybody was just cool. You know, so I always noticed that. I said, subhanAllah. You know, it's like, why is it that I can go to school with all black folks? They accept me. Nobody mentions race. But then I go to family and then they want to always mention race and race and race. So I started just like, it started to cause a lot of anger as I was growing up. You know, so I started to become very, 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 very uh, hateful towards my own people, like, you know, white people, because I'm like, yeah, y'all, y'all, I hate y'all, <laughs> you know, like literally, you know, and I know it's not that I don't hate white people, but there was just like this, 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 uh, this, this type, you know, this rich, stuck up type of white people. I just grew to hate because, like I said, in our situation with my mother, we were struggling. You know, my mother, we never live rich. You know, my mother, she did the best that she could, but I mean, she had her problems, as we, as you're gonna see, you know, throughout all these, you know, all these, as the series, you know, you see my mother's going to jail, she's doing, so we had our own issues, you know, and obviously, if you have a mother in and out of jail, in and out of drug rehab, obviously, you're not, you're not living the the good life, you know, and it's just a reality. We're going from apartment complex to apartment complex. So when I got to middle school, and this is the, this is where all the problems started. This was like the first time that I'm in school with like these Beverly Hills 90210 people, you know, these, these rich kids. And, you know, so this is what I'm telling my sister. I was like, this is my first experience being exposed to that. I just come from a sixth grade center in Brentwood, which is right in the projects. That's where I was in sixth grade. And then seventh grade, I'm in this, in this Beverly Hills environment, this, 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 you know, hairspray and all this, you know, this, this, this whole, different environment that I never had been exposed to, even though, uh, you know, I mean, because it doesn't matter. It's not, it's not a race issue. It's a class issue because this is a class issue. We were never in that type of class of people to be around these types of individuals, but because where we moved, the, you know, we were like, uh, you know, like where we lived at was, was, was just, you know, trailers and, you know, just poor people. But over like just maybe two miles down the street, that's where all the rich people live. You got like maybe three, four miles you got hidden uh, hidden hills. You can look that up on Google Maps, and you see this is a country club. And so these these people are coming from those areas. I don't know these people. So they start laughing at, laughing at me, how I'm dressing. Look at you, you poor, you this, you know. So it just you know the anger started to build up, started to build up. So and then, and that's what I told my you know. So when I was telling my sister this, I said you know. So I started. I I got so angry. I was like you you guys, you made my life like a you know like this living hell. You know. Where it's like every day I go to school, I just want to, you know what I'm saying? I just get angry, but I can't do anything because like, I'm not scared of them. I'm scared of my mother. You know what I'm saying? So my mother, because I, I ended up failing eighth grade, you know, because we got into a lot of problems, a lot of problems. So I ended up failing and having to go to summer school and I never hear the end of it. So I'm like, you know, so a long time. But uh, so that was like eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade. So in the 10th grade, you know, I was in 10th grade. I never passed 10th grade. I mean, even till now, I still haven't passed 10th grade So, because I dropped out of school. So, but at this point, I was just like, I was just taking my anger out on them. I was like, you guys, you're not, y'all going to suffer. And, you know, whenever I see a rich person, y'all going to suffer. I see anybody that has something I don't have, you're going to suffer. 
So this was my mindset. And that was the same type of mindset that took me into that, that whole revolutionary thing that you're going to see. And, you know, as you've already started to see, but you're going to see it more in the following episodes. So when I, when I say that the shooting was random, it was random, but it wasn't random. Because I walked over to the next street with my friend. We chose the biggest house. And we said, that house right there. These, these, and I, and I, and I told my sister, I said, these rich people, I'm never going to let them relax. Even in their own houses, they're not going to relax. So I took the, sh sh bah, 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 and started shooting. And uh, this is the police. This, this is what they told me. I, didn't, I don't know, because obviously I wasn't there. But the police, when they interviewed the man, like basically he was drinking uh, tea. He had the glass going up to his mouth. And the and the glass shattered right in his hand. So even the police told me, he said, that's how close you came to killing him. You know, so this was what I ended up going to jail for the first time. You know, this, it was this this issue. And uh, so when I, but this is going to, I'm going to get to this point now. That when I got out of jail, I got introduced to this book, which was a monster, the, you know, the autobiography of, a, of an L.A. gang member. And I read this book like that, you know, like, like fast. I ended up reading that book six times, seven times actually, but six times during those days. I would literally read the book, wait like two months and read it again. When I was in jail, I read it again. When I was not in jail, I read it again. So I literally read it six times and I read it a seventh time when I was in Riyadh, you know, because I just wanted to go back and I wanted to reread the book because I wanted to see that book again with me in the mindset of me hating everything that that book was about. You know, I wanted to see like how I could, you know, how I would feel about reading that book now with the mindset that I have. Like now I've been to Yemen, I've been to Sardia, sat with Olama, read all these books, you know, done all this stuff and been around all these different types of individuals and all this is my whole life has completely changed. Now I wanted to sit down and I wanted to read that book. So during the COVID lockdown, I had the book on my Kindle and I read it again. For the seventh time. And you know, it's still a good book. Like the way that he wrote it, it was, it was very well written. The way that he goes into the stories and, but, uh, it's a long time. It's a, it's a very, it was a very influential book at that time. So when I read that book, all I wanted to do is I wanted to act it out. I wanted to act it out. You know, everything about his whole life and the, the way that he did things, I said, I'm going, I'm, uh, I'm like, I'm going to be like Monster. I have Monster tattooed on my arm. You know, just because of just a, as a representation of that book, like how much I wanted to be like how he was in the book. So he talked about he was wearing these like leather, like these leather gardening gloves. I went out and bought him the gloves. I put them in my right pocket. I put the, the blue bandana in my and, and I wear all blue. Even when the police came and arrested me, I was in a blue sweater. You know, it's like that's how I was. You know, he used to talk about like how he used to ride down the street and he'd have a shotgun over the handlebars as he was riding in on the street. And I used to ride down the street with a rifle over the handlebars. The neighbors used to be like, oh my God, this kid's crazy. But like every single thing that he did, like everything that he said that this is what, this is what we're about. I said, this is all right, I'm gonna try to do this, which is stupid, but it's the mindset because it shows you the influence. But the thing is, is that, you know, when we look at the traits of people who are successful, you know, these are the traits of the people that are successful is that they read those types of books. They read about the great people, whatever it is that they want to be, right? They read about those individuals. So now when I switched from this mindset of like this, this street thug, stupid mindset that I was in, this foolishness that I was in, this, this self-destruction mode. And I alhamdulillah, you know, Allah bless me that I made it out, you know, only got shot at, but I didn't get shot, you know? So I, you know, I wouldn't say unscathed because mentally, it, it, it had a toll and it comes with a toll because you can't do this type of thumb and this type of oppression to people and it doesn't come back to you. It comes back to you and you know, you're going to have to get purified from all that, you know, stuff that you did. And I'm not even going to talk about it. Like that's type, that, that, that era from like, uh, 17 when I got out of jail, when I was 17 up until I went back to jail and, uh, on, it was, it was on Halloween night that I went back to jail because I was actually going to go to my, to my, my father's house to go see my sister and because she wanted to go out and I just wanted to go just be with my sister. So my aunt was coming to pick me up. The police beat, beat her to it. Like they surrounded my whole house and just took me out. Like, you know, so I mean, from that time, from the time that I got out of jail the first time to the time where I went back for the year sentence, you know, is I will never talk about that. I will never talk about that stuff ever. Never. Not even in the book. In the book is just like, uh, there's some things, I'm, you know, there are a lot of things that happen. That they are never to be discussed, ever. 
I don't care. You know, even if they were to give me immunity, I would never discuss that stuff. Never. Never, never, not, never with anybody, because it's just evil. Like, there's nothing but pure evil that happened in those days. But it was, the, the, it was like I said, it was that, that influence. You know, I saw the book, and I said, well, at that, at that time, being at that impressionable age, you know, that, that youth, and looking for, like, this adventure, then I said, okay, this is what I want to do. And then when I went to jail a few times, I was like, okay, this is not what I want to do. This is not the life, because it, what is this? I mean, just in and out, in and out. I can't have any type of istikrar. Like a stability. And my whole complaint with my whole life was no stability. So, I mean, so when I got out of jail like the last time, then I started reading about revolutionaries. Started reading about Che Guevara. Started reading the autobiography of Karl Marx. I started reading uh, about these different groups that were fighting revolutions. And then I, I switched it. You know, I switched it now. And I, now, I'm not trying to be like that no more. I don't have that stuff anymore. I don't have the blue sweaters and the bandanas. All that's gone. And I remember I went to my grandfather's grave and took the last one and threw it on his grave. I said, I'm done with all this stuff. And I walked off. And my grandmother got angry about that. And I told my mother, I said, well, I, if she, well, I didn't say well, I, but I said, you know, if she understood what that meant. Because I threw it on the ground. It was on his grave, but I threw it on the ground. So I was saying, like, just like he's dead, this life is dead. And, like, I buried it with him. I'm done with that. You know, so if she understood what it represented, it, she wouldn't be so angry. Because it represented, I'm done with this. You know, and then that's when I made that switch, you know, to like this wannabe gangster, because that's all it was. It's just wannabe. All, all of these people that just, because, you know, the whole idea of trying to be a gangster, or a thug, it goes against principle. It goes against any type of moral standing. It's not natural. This whole gangster mentality is not a natural mentality. You know, you have to be taken away from your fithra, far, far away from your fithra. You know, to be this, this type of oppressive type of person to where, like, life, people's property, it doesn't matter to you anymore. So, alhamdulillah, because I was a Muslim, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, with Tawbah, you come back to your fitra. But you still suffer because you still, you did things. You, you oppress people. You did things, you're going to feel regret. And, you you know, even till today, I'm just sitting there like, oh, God, why did I do that? Even till today, it's, you know, it just pops in my head. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? And... You know, it's a lot, a lot of things. So, Allah Musta'an. But like I said, it's the influence. You know, and it's, the, you know, if we don't get that influence from books, we get the influence from people. We look at like, you know, we take like certain people as like, you know, looking like, make them like, uh, put them up as a, as a hero, to some type of hero status, to where we idolize, not idolize this person, but like try to emulate this person and try to be like this person and, and try to take on their, you know, every, everything that they do. So for some people that might be a drug dealer, some people that might be a CEO in a company, some people that might be a lawyer, some people that might be a doctor, some people that might be a gang member. But the point is, everybody's going to look at that. So me, I would always go through the books, and I would see something I would read, and I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. So when I switched over now to the revolution, and now the whole revolutionary idea, which is also still garbage, but it's better garbage than this, you know, because I'm not out on the streets causing chaos. At that point, khalas, I mean, I was committing no crimes. I wasn't oppressing people. Now I was, I was thinking more along the lines of trying to, you know, give back instead of like keep taking, you know, because even like at one point, you know, which, uh, well, I won't go tell that story because that's going to come in a future episode because that's not what this episode is about, like the future stories. That's going to come when it comes, inshallah. But uh, for now, I'm just like the, the focus is on like the reading and the books. So and you just keep going along and you see the progression, the change. And because it's always, whenever I started to get into a certain idea, a certain mode of thinking, I always try to look at like, okay, who are the strongest people in this? And then like, okay, the revolutionary people, who are the, who are the strongest revolutionary? Okay, in America, we had like the Black Panther Party, Huey P. Newton, and you know, I read, I read Eldridge Cleaver's book, A Soul on Ice. I read George Jackson's book, uh, Solid Dad Brother. You know, I read, I had the Black Panther speak. I even have Solid Dad Brother right now in the other room, in my other, because I have this mekteba and I got a mekteba in the, in the, in the living room. So, uh, it's Solidar Brothers there, Black Panther Speak, Malcolm X, all this stuff I was just kept reading and reading. You know, reading about like, uh, you know, uh, what's his name, Leonard Peltier, and what happened with the, you know, the, the, the Lakota tribe when the FBI came and how he ended up on death row. Mumia Abu Jamal's, you know, Alive from Death Row. So, all of these books, they, I just started looking at who are the strongest revolutionaries. Now, who can I follow now? Who can I try to be like? And I try to start to take on that behavior, start to take on the lingo, start to, because that, when we talk about a dean, 
You know, because when we get to Islam, when we get to that point, that's what the deen is. It's a way of life. So even though I'm not pleased with that type of life, but the thing is, is you see that pattern. So now it's like, okay, I'm going along and I'm going along, but now I start to learn about Salafiyah. Now I start to learn about the science of hadith. And that there's actually people that learn hadith and practice the hadith. And then now I learn about all these salaf, you know. All of these people like, you know, Abu Zinad, Al-A'raj, uh, the Sufyan Thawri, Sufyan Ibn Uyayna, uh, Zuhri, Shu'ba. I start to learn about all these these individuals that like memorized hundreds of thousands of hadiths with the Asa'anid that transmitted the hadiths that, you know, you go and you read the chains of narrations from Bukhari. So then I go when I was in Damaj and now, I'm, and now when I start doing, when I start to learn the Arabic language, start to understand the Arabic language. So now I'm sitting up in Damaj in the Maktab of Sheikh Mubil Rahimullah reading like Sirah Alam and Nubala and looking at all the Tarajim. I'm reading the Tarjim of Bukhari. I'm reading the Tarjim of Muslim of Imam Ahmed. Then going through all the different Salah from the chain of narrations, Abdullah ibn Mubarak. You know, Suf the Sufyan An, which is Sufyan Ibn Uyayn and Sufyan Authority. So, and, and, and just reading, 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 reading all these Tarajim. But now you start, now it's a change. But you got to keep the same attitude, because the same attitude that w what made me successful on the streets, right? And then gave me that, this type of, I didn't, I guess I didn't have success as a revolutionary, because I, nobody was around me that wanted to do that type of stuff. Everybody thought I was crazy at the time. But now I'm around people. That are trying to follow this, this you know, first off, they're trying to follow the sunnah. And they're trying to enact the sunnah. But they're also reading in the same tarajim that I'm reading. And they're trying to live the lives of those people. Because that's what we have to do. If we truly, truly want to be successful, we have to go and read about the lives of those great people. You know, first off, you start off with the seerah of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then you go down and you read like a book like Ustul Ghaba, if you're able to read Arabic. And you read the tarajim of the salaf, also uh, of the sahaba, sorry. Ustu Ghaba is like maybe four or five volumes. All Tarajim of the Salaf. You also have like uh, Imam Ibn Jozi. Imam Jozi, Ibn Jozi, he wrote a book, it's called Sifat al Safwa, where he gives all these brief Tarajim. Ibn Jozi also, uh, Ibn Jozi also wrote another book called uh, uh, Manaqib. Manaqib al Imam Ahmed, which is the best, uh, best book on the life of Imam Ahmed. And he brings the chains of narrations even for the statements, you know, from Imam Ahmed. It's very, very interesting. It's a very good book. It's a very, it's the best, best book on the life of Imam Ahmed. And the Sheikh is actually the one that introduced me to the book. Because I was asking about that and I didn't know he was standing there. And he told me, he said, come with me. I said, like, hey, you're the Sheikh. You're the Sheikh. <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, come, come. You know, he didn't say that. You know, I didn't say that. And I was just like, you know, like my, my dumbfounded look. You know, I was like starstruck. Like, wow, man, you're the Sheikh. And he's like, yeah, come. And he handed me the book. He said, go read this. This is the best book about the life of Imam Ahmed by Ibn Josie. So you start to read these books. And you start to see the, the, the way that the Salaf are because you see there's always that type of formula, that recipe for greatness, right? And then they weren't trying to be great. It wasn't like they were trying to be great. What they were trying to do, they were just trying to follow that same pattern of the Prophet, of the Sahaba. And they tried to just keep, you know, just keep the same, keep it going. Keep that, you know, keep that knowledge going and keep the same, you know, without changing. Keep it as pure as possible. So, but that's how they achieved that greatness. So now when we go back and we read about their lives... And then we try to like take on the characteristics, characteristics that they have. So if, if you know, if we see like you know these types of people when we when we re, uh, read in their tarajim, you know, who are thiqatun, thabtun, alim, faqih, um, abid, zahid, you know, all these types of names that you know, like you know, you see in the books of half of them in Hajr, you see in Tahdib al Tahdib, Tahdib al Kamal, you see in all these books of Rijal how they praise these types of individuals. It's because they had these types of characteristics. You think that they were sleeping at night? In the last third of the night, do you think they were sleeping or do you think they were praying? You think on Mondays and Thursdays that he was eating and drinking, you know, or is he fasting? You think now after Fajr that he just say, oh, I'm going back to sleep. Or was he there reading the Quran? So you look at these characteristics that they had. And this is what made them successful. So the same thing that made them successful would also make us successful. Just like all this other garbage that I was trying to do was, you know, trying, trying to follow that same pattern. Also, you know, give me some type of temporary success as far as dunya is concerned, right? But this now is not a temporary success. When you start to follow that pattern and you start to discipline yourself to like take on the type of characteristics that they have. And this is why this is very important. You see that, that, that you know, like I said, throughout my whole life, it's always these books that influence me. And even in Salafia, it was always the books that influenced me. 
Even right now, I'm waiting for the book to come right now. The book is with UPS. Uh, Sifat the Safwa, I ordered it because I want to go back and read all these Tarajim again. You know, because we always have to constantly be reminded. You know, the thing is, is like, you know, if, if we just sit around people who are not really serious, we start to think highly of ourselves and we shouldn't because we're not really nothing. We're not much. In fact, we live in the dumbest generation. If you go and you read like, you read the Tarajim of the Salaf and how they were, and you look at the level of knowledge they had, and you look at us, you're like, why are we alive? You know, seriously, we are the absolute stupidest generation on the face of this earth. Dunya-wise and Dean-wise. Every, like, there's no, there's no getting around it. I mean, can you imagine that we're sitting here today in 2023? You know, they're like having these discussions about what a woman is. I mean, are we not the dumbest, dumbest, stupidest generation on the face of this earth? So the same thing. Right now, most of the Muslims have trouble memorizing al arbain and Nawawiyah. <laughs> you know, forget sitting down and memorizing 100,000 hadiths like half of them in Hajar al Askalani with the uh, chains and narrations. He had his chains and narrations going back to Bukhari. So he had Bukhari memorized with the chains and narrations that he had going back to every, you know, to Bukhari with those ahadith. And that's how he memorized it. What was this? How many years ago was this? 600 years ago. So over that 600 years ago, look how stupid we become. Show me a person on the face of the earth right now that's memorized Arabain and Noah with the, with the chains and narrations for every hadith in Arabain. Show me one person in America that's memorized 10 hadiths, you know, that they can read from their memory right now with chains and narrations. So we're, we're the dumbest generation. So we have to go back and we have to read about the greatest generation. We have to keep our heads in the books. So as we're also studying... We're trying to learn our religion. We're trying to learn fiqh. We're trying to learn a of fiqh. We're trying to learn tafsir. And of course, the most important thing, you know, learning tawheed and, and the correct aqidah. But, uh, you know, all the sciences of the religion that we're trying to understand, we always have to take that time to go back and read. Read about those great people. The people that really, really influenced, you know, you know, you see, like, they were just, they were about action. They weren't just about talking. Like us, you know, we do it. We, we talk, mashallah. We're so good at talking. We're the talking generation, but we're not the acting generation. They talked little, and they acted a lot. You know, and that's why you can see, like, they can say a few words, and, you know, you'd have to explain their few words in a whole magellan, like a whole volume. You explain some of the, you know, just a few words that they say, you'd explain it in a whole volume. But us, we speak a whole volume that you could summarize in one sentence. You know, that's how weak we are. So we need to go back, and we have to continue to read about these types of people. Like I said, in my in my life, as I'm giving you this, you're seeing the bad example. But inshallah, as we continue, inshallah, you see uh, the better example. Inshallah, when we get to like, when we get to Atlanta, Los Angeles, when I'm with Fareed, well, you know, it's gonna take some patience, inshallah. But but like uh, like I said, I, that's my advice to myself and advice to everybody listening, is you know to constantly go back and just keep reading about these great people of our religion. You know, read about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, read his sirah. You know, read Zad al-Ma'ad. Read uh, Mukhtasar uh, Sirat al-Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Mukhtasar uh, Rasul, uh, Mukhtasar Sirat al-Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, uh, Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, because he took the, the sirah of uh, Ibn Hisham, and he did a Mukhtasar of it. You know, read these books. You know, go back and read the, 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 most, the best book of sirah. Is Bukhari, Muslim, Sunan Abi Dawood, Sunan al Tirmidhi, Sunan al Nasa'i, Sunan Ibn Majah, Al Mawatta, Muslim of Imam Ahmed, Al Musannaf li Abdul Razak Sanani, Al Musannaf li Ibn Abi Shayba. These are the best, these are the best books of Sirah. It's to go back and actually read the hadith and read the life of the Prophet through the hadith. But then you have these books like, uh, like I said, Ustul Ghaba which is the Tarajim of the, of the Sahaba. Then, of course, you have Sirah Alam and Ubala. You have Tathkirat al Hufal al Dhahabi also, which is a smaller book with smaller Tarajim, but still beneficial. You have Sifat al Safwa by Ibn Jozi. You have a lot of these books. And if you, don't, if you can't read the Arabic language, then find these different Tarajim. Read about the life of Bukhari. Read about the life of all these Aemma and see how they were. And this is what you should strive to be. You know, not looking at the people nowadays, you know, because us, well, I, if, if people started to want to be like people like me, you know, we're doomed. We're doomed in this society. You know, you, you have to strive to be something great. You know, we don't have greatness anymore. That, that died out a long time ago. We have a few individuals, some, 
you know, a few shining lights throughout the world. You know, alhamdulillah, ulama are still here and they're still teaching. But like that super greatness that you saw in the past, is, it's like, you know, if we don't bring that back, then I don't know what to say. But the only way that you can ever bring something back, like at least in your own life, is to keep reading about those people and to keep trying to be like what they were like. Stop looking at the people nowadays and looking, trying to find influence amongst the people nowadays. You have to go back and find the influence from before. Because that's how you're going to truly, truly, truly be successful in, in this life and the next. Wallahu musta'an. Wa ilahuna subhanakullahu wa bihamdik. Shadow and Layla Hill and Stuck Viroko to Boyd.